Money. Some people say it's the root of all evil. Some people say it's the key to happiness. I say, gimme, give gimme give some of that. <laughs> Anyway, this video really piqued my interest. It's called Why You'll Probably Never Make Enough Money because that's like how it feels. You set a goal, you reach that goal, it becomes your normal. You set another goal, you reach that goal, it becomes your normal. And that seems like that's just the cycle of it. So when do you stop and when do you become happy? Let's find out in this video. I am Barack Obama. I am Barack Obama. If you ever try to get your finances in order, chances are you failed a lot. But the truth is, it's not your fault. Americans say they need a salary of $233,000 a year to feel financially comfortable. Not me, bro. Not in LA, brother. But in 2022, the real median household income was just a third of that at $74,580. While the median income continues to fall, average household spending increases, reaching $72,967 in 2022. But first, to understand who or what is at fault and how much money Americans actually need, we need to understand where our money is going. Looking at the numbers, it's clear that this isn't financially sustainable. A spending pattern where people must use 98% of their income just to get by. A cycle perpetuated by six major expenses. First, there is housing to think about. Depending if you own or rent, your monthly expense could be drastically different. Let's just start with me. I want to hear your reaction to this right now. My rent is $4,200 every month. Does that sound crazy to you? Or does that sound like, eh, it's bad, but tell me. Because people be like, oh, you should be buying a house, mortgage. That's what everybody says, might as well be buying. But I did the math. This house is not even a crazy house. I love this house. It's three bedrooms, it's really spacious, but it's probably worth like $1.2 million now. I wanna say a million dollar house is like a three to $400,000 house, like in the middle of the country is what you get for a million dollars in LA, bro. I'm not even joking. So even if I wanted to buy a house, the type of house that I need, that I'd be comfortable in, the mortgage property taxes would cost more than I'm paying to rent right now. If I bought this same house, I'd probably be paying like 6,000 a month. Yeah, it's nuts, bro. Thankfully, rent payments is usually the same every month with no surprises. Property taxes increasing, none of your business. Roof leaking, call the landlord. When it comes to owning a house, however, it's a different story. The typical monthly mortgage is- Yeah, to be fair, like when anything goes wrong, it's on them. And there's been a few things that have gone wrong. So I'm not on that. My guy, Kaylin Ellis, what's bro? <laughs> Come to Florida, is that where you at, bro? Florida? Hey, look, I don't know about Florida, bro. I mean, I've never been. Don't y'all got like alligators and shit? Like, well, here's the thing. I'm LA born and raised. I've been in LA my whole life. I haven't even been to that many states, so I need to go travel some more to really find out. Let's see, let's see, let's, let's get back into this. $5. But then there's HOA fees, property taxes, and the occasional block toilet to account for. So for both renters and homeowners, let's say the average housing expense, including utilities, is about $2,400 a month. Next, there's transportation. 91.7% of households have at least one car. In recent years, the rise in the cost of car ownership has outpaced inflation. The cost to own a vehicle is at an all-time high. AAA says the average cost to own a single car is $894 a month. Then there's groceries and food. Hear me out, I like cars. Did I just buy a Tesla Model X Plaid? Was it expensive as hell? Yes, but. I'm not paying 800 a month because I just put a fat ass down payment down to trick my brain. You know what I'm saying? Not my proudest decision, but it does make me happy every day that I drive it. Happiness, you know what I'm saying? Americans yeah, spend Disneyland on average $9,343 $9, per year or $778 a month on this. Next, healthcare. When you're Damn, sick, you 700 go to a month? doctor's office or just lay on your couch hoping you'll get better because you want to avoid that hefty medical bill, which nowadays typically costs $8,200 per year or $683 a month. Then there's student loans and childhood education. Okay, now about. I'm not going to lie. So far, like some of this isn't the most accurate, at least from my experience. 
So 24, okay, transportation, fair enough. Food and groceries, yeah, okay. Healthcare, yeah, I mean, it can get like that. I just actually had to get healthcare for my first time ever, bro. Because I just turned 26, so I can't be on my mom's insurance anymore. But I'm paying like 200 and something. I don't know if that's good or bad, honestly. It's my first time. I just went to the doctor today to give them my blood. Motherfuckers charged me $10, bro. Fuck, I'm paying $230 a month for it. Niggas gonna charge me $10? To take my blood, bro? I wasn't donating blood. They're doing tests or whatever. Loans in childhood education to think about. Whether you studied electrical engineering from MIT or majored in poetic <laughs> philosophy in Iowa State, student loan payments can vary. For a household with two college graduates, payments can be another four to six hundred dollars a month. Then there's education expenses for kids. After school activities, tutoring programs, computers. No kids popping out of me, bro. I'm saving that bill. $162,900 from kindergarten to 12th grade, about $12,500 a year or $1,000 a month. Next, there's credit card bills, <laughs> which no. are about $430 per month, and then another $300 for miscellaneous expenses. This is financial advice right here. This personal care, that $300, that should just be, you buy those things on your credit card, but these two things should be the same, bro. Do credit cards though. Raymond, I disagree. Credit cards are fire. Bro, my honeymoon, for example, went to Cancun. First class flight, free, because of credit card points. Definitely use credit cards, but like, don't carry a balance every month. That's what you shouldn't be doing. Don't sleep on credit card points for sure. The things I've done with credit card points would shock you, bro. Some of it doesn't even make sense. I've stayed at luxury hotels It'll be like a thousand a night type shit. But for some reason, when you transfer the points, let's say from Chase, you transfer your points directly to the hotel's reward system. The dollar amount, it just don't be, it'd be so discounted. It don't even make sense sometimes. So don't sleep on that. I mostly use Chase, bro. My big boy card, Chase Sapphire, it costs 500 a year. But you get like $200 back in travel credits and like all these cool things that come with it to where it almost pays for itself. <laughs> I don't wanna nerd out too much, but look up credit card churning. I was part of a Reddit community. It's called credit card churning. What we do in this community is they list all the cards and the current bonuses that they have. Okay, so for example, with the current card I have, you sign up, you spend X amount of money within one to three months or something like that, and you get hella points. So that's how I went on that trip for my honeymoon and I had two first class tickets for free because I signed up for a credit card, spent X amount. I think I got like 60,000 points. So just look into it, look into it, all right? But just be careful with the credit cards. Don't carry a balance, pay it off every month. You just treat it like a debit card. Don't treat it like fake money. That's all you gotta do. As a result, 61% of Americans don't have enough savings to cover a $1,000 emergency. Like when your car breaks down, you stub your toe too hard, or when you lose your job, which, let's yeah. face it, is more likely now than ever. But how and when did our financial situation get so bad? The idea was if you worked hard and saved, you'd be financially okay. But it's not so easy anymore. In recent years, the gap between rising costs and income growth have been growing larger. As a result, 62% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. The weird thing is, income has been growing for decades now. Why am I struggling to pay for college when my parents managed on minimum wage? Why can't I afford a tiny apartment when they owned a house at 25? In economics, they call this purchasing power. Basically, it's how much you can buy with a defined amount of money. Take this $100 bill, for example. In five years, although this will still be a $100 bill, how much you can actually buy with it will be less. Today, for $100, I can maybe get a cup of coffee from Blue Bottle and a quarter pounder of cheese from McDonald's. In three years, for $100, I might only be able to get a cup of coffee from Dunkin' Donuts. In the 1970s, the minimum wage was That's about a little bit $2.30. Of a stretch. The median price of a U.S. house was $17,000. Two high school ah, kids could get married on graduation day, start working, and own a house in less than four years. 
Today, unless you're making over $18 an hour, you're poorer than a minimum wage worker from the 1970s, adjusted Damn. for inflation. Although paychecks are substantially bigger than 40 years ago, the reality is real average income has barely budged since 1978. The problem is, Americans are now more productive and work harder than any other time in history. Naturally, this rise in labor Ooh. productivity results in an increase in company revenue. And for a period of time, this was true, until we got here. In the 1980s, a gap started to form. Productivity continued to increase with technological advances, fax machines, floppy disk, pagers, but growth in wage and compensation started to slow down. So where is all this new and extra revenue going? If you're in a nine to five, I don't think you should work hard. I think you should do the bare minimum. <laughs> in any of my nine to fives, I was never an overachiever. I did what I needed to do and I left immediately when it was time, bro. Here's a hint. In the 1970s, a CEO earned 20 times more than their typical worker. Today, a CEO makes 399 times Sheesh. more. While paychecks have been growing over time for millennials and Gen Z, wealth has been decreasing. Today, millennials hold 41% less wealth than a similarly aged adult in 1989. Well, and that's it's all unfortunate. because of this one thing. Economists use the cost of thriving index to more accurately gauge our financial situation. Basically, this index shows how many days a typical worker would need to work in a given year to earn. Nothing I hate more than seeing a man's toes without my consent, bro. <laughs> earn enough uh, income to cover the major expenses for a family of four. There's food, healthcare, transportation, and education. In 1985, the average major expenses for a family of four was around $13,227. The typical male worker needed to work about 30 weeks to cover this cost. But in 2018, the average major living expense is now $54,441. And the typical male worker has to work 53 weeks to cover this cost. In case you didn't know, there were only 52 weeks in a year. Unless you live in an alternative universe, the reality is the typical worker is not even living paycheck to paycheck anymore. They're actually doing worse. Older generations like baby boomers love to say That's these tragic. financial issues isn't because of income. Rather, it's because we're spending too much on unnecessary things. $20 avocado toast, $7 coffees, and an annual Netflix subscription. But is any of that actually true? A 2021 research study revealed how different generations spend their money, and the data is pretty shocking. You know, there's a lot of people, shout out to Graham Stephan. They say if you just don't drink Starbucks and you don't buy your $20 avocado toast, you'll be fine. Something about that just doesn't sit right with me. Like, sure, you can stop spending a lot of money on coffee, but like how much is are you really saving by that one thing? Because I've done it myself. I've looked at my expenses and tried to cancel smaller subscriptions. When it comes to which generation spends the most money, Generation X, those who were born between 1965 to 1980, takes first place with an average annual spending of $83,357. In Damn. second place, Millennials with an average spending of $69,061. And then in third place, baby boomers with $62,203. At the surface level, this looks like the baby boomers are right. Millennials are spending more money. But when we break down the actual spending percentages by expense category, a completely different story emerges. Across the board, the biggest expense for every generation is housing, accounting for more than 30% of total annual spending. Similarly, the second biggest expense is transportation, cars, Ubers, and public buses. But where it starts to get interesting is the third biggest expense, when generational spending splits. For boomers, their third biggest expense is food and then healthcare. For millennials and Gen X, their their biggest expense is personal insurance and pension than food. Mm. So based on the data, younger generations clearly spend less of their income on food than baby boomers, which dispels the avocado toast and $7 coffees trope. But what about Netflix subscriptions? Surely millennials are spending all their money going out, partying, drinking, and watching movies, right? The data shows that all generations spend more than 4% of their total expenditures on entertainment. However, both baby boomers and Gen X devote a higher percentage of their income to this category than millennials. 
If the afford take that affordability crisis is not because of unnecessary spending, then what is the actual amount of money that Americans actually need? When it comes to what feeling financially secure actually looks like, let's just say it's complicated. In 2023, a research- I really forgot where this video was headed for a bit, but yeah, it's about, you would probably never make enough money. Okay, I thought it was gonna be like more about how you're greedier, how you want, you want, and the want never goes away. But I'm on board with this too. I'm fucking learning, bro. Research study found that on average, you need $68,499 after taxes to live comfortably across the 25 largest metro areas, San Francisco, Boston, New York which I thought was weird because that's less than the current median household of $74,580. Yeah. And we already determined that this number isn't financially sustainable. So what's going on? Why is there such a large disconnect between how much Americans actually need and how much research studies say we need? Professor Amy Glassmere and her colleagues might know a thing or two about this. Her research into wages started when the US was coming out from a recession. She I think all of my family and friends are in LA and you know, they're all struggling living with their parents. So I guess maybe that's how they're able to afford all that stuff is just cause housing is such a big chunk for everyone. But I guess low key is just impossible for people, at least out here to just move out on their own. They gotta have roommates or live with their parents. She witnessed countless people lose their jobs and financially struggle. In response, she created the MIT Living Wage Calculator. Its objective was clear, to help people determine the living wage they needed to earn to support themselves and their family based on where they live. Naturally, a family in New York City would need to earn more money than a family from Kansas. Over time, MIT's living wage calculator became the gold standard. It's ranked on the first page of Google, used by policymakers and researchers alike. Even major companies like IKEA and Patagonia use it to determine how much to pay their workers based on where they live. Which sounds great, but this is actually the crux of the problem. A research study found that you need $68,499 to live comfortably. That's less than the current median household of $74,580. There are three major mm. issues with MIT's calculator that no one is talking about. And I only found out after digging into the technical details of how it works. First, the calculator does not budget for common living expenses. No prepared meals, no restaurants, no vacations, no holidays, or any money to cover anything unexpected. Broke your phone? Good luck. Fridge stopped working? Oops. Got a parking ticket? Too bad. Next, it doesn't incorporate savings of any kind. Meaning if the calculator says you need to earn $60,000 to live, you are expected to spend the entire $60,000. There won't be anything extra. No emergency fund, no savings, no safety net. Want to retire one day? You can't. Want to buy a house? Sorry. Next, the living wage calculation is only a tiny step up from poverty. Meaning if your state's poverty rate is $30,000 a year, the calculator will say your living wage is $32,000. MIT's living wage calculator, and I quote from its website, draws a very fine line between the financial independence of the working poor and the need to seek out public assistance or suffer consistent and severe housing and food insecurity. Straight up, but the just real being problem poor. isn't how the calculator works. Professor Glasmere is transparent and documents all the assumptions and methodologies used. The real problem is this. In 1929, President Theodore Roosevelt introduced the idea of a living wage to the country. He said a living wage should let workers secure the elements of a normal standard of All right, living, I'm like, what is this guy getting to it? education, <laughs> recreation, childcare, a cushion for periods of sickness, and savings for old age. While most Americans understand this to be the definition of a living wage, the calculator, which is named the living wage calculator, doesn't achieve this. In reality, it calculates the minimum rock bottom wage you need to not starve or be homeless. Knowingly or not, research studies and policymakers use MIT's living wage calculator all the time. As a result, they're all using this weak ass calculator to calculate how people should be living when in reality all this calculator is doing is reminding everybody 
that they're poor? Like literally the amount of money that pops out of the calculator is the bare minimum that somebody needs to survive. And that's what the government officials are using to say, nah, you guys are good, bro. America. Study after study consistently underestimates how much money an American actually needs. They think they're using a living wage in the traditional sense, but in reality, the number is just a step up from poverty. The problem is that these studies set the baseline for major companies like IKEA and Patagonia on how much they should pay their employees. Companies like these enjoy the reputational benefits of claiming to pay a living wage based on MIT's living wage calculator, but they completely leave out how this wage is calculated. So until we have a new calculator methodology, we won't have an empirical number on how much money Americans actually need. Okay, so that video didn't really turn out how I thought it would be, but it still had a lot of inf interesting information in it. But let me know what you guys think in the comments because a lot of people in the chat were talking about how different it is out in Europe. Like, should I just move to another country, bro? Should I go move to like Bali or something where like $100 is like, I don't know, 1.5 million or something out there? Like, is that the move? Let me know. Catch you in the next one. I am Barack Obama. I am Barack Obama.